This is community activist Derek Muhammad, and you are watching Willie D Live. Welcome everybody, I'm Willie D along with Danny and we're about to go in with my homie, my brother, community activist, foot soldier, killer for justice. <laughs> I mean, y'all don't understand this, y'all really don't understand the magnitude of this guy's impact. You may not have never heard, ever heard of him, but in the streets of H-Town, we love this man. He is very revered because he put it out there. He put his heart, his soul, and everything he got into helping our people achieve success and advance. And he makes sure that he gets out there and he fights for our causes. And he do it unapologetically. And he do it for no fame, no attention. He just moves. He just keeps right along and making it happen time and time and time again. He's been on like if, if, you, if you're from Houston and you watch the news, he's on the news like two, three times a week for the last like five, six years. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Muhammad. My brother. Man, say man. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to do live claps for me. We, 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 we got enough money to do the claps. Let shit. me clap for me being here on the man. D Live show. Man, so so we go back. Like I say, you my brother, man. You know, and and, and we've been we've been riding together for a long time. We went to the same school, grew up in the same you know, community yes, and everything. Yes, sir. And I know the thing that I know about you um, on a personal level, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, is that I know your, your dad died when you were young. Yes, sir. And, and your mom had some issues with drug abuse. Right. And you you saw it all. You, I mean, you saw the prostitution. You saw the gang banging. You saw the killing. You saw the police brutality. Mm -hmm. Where did this sense of self and doing for others, service to others, come from? I always had it in me to want to make a difference in the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. And I always said to myself, "Will I don't think I could ever be a doctor." or work in the medical industry because it always gave me great pain to see other people suffer, to okay. see other people bleed, to see other people in pain. Their pain put me in pain. Mm -hmm. So I always had it in my mind that I wanted to be um, a light bearer for my community. Mm -hmm. And I remember even when I was young, a lot of my friends started getting lots of tattoos. They would get the gold grills. Mm -hmm. And I used to have a little voice in the back of my head that said, you know what, I'm not going to do that right now because one day I'm going to be somebody. Didn't know what I right. was going to be or right. who I was going to be. But me, like every other young brother wow. and sister in the hood, you have that sense of greatness inside of you. There's a voice inside of you. But too often we listen to other voices other than that voice. Right. And we fall short when it comes to us living out our purpose. But I would have to say that the nation of Islam showed me how to help my people. And that is where my transformation began. Be, be, began. So how old were you when you got involved with the nation? I was about 21 years old when I got involved okay, so, with the nation. Okay, now that's significant because yes, at 21 that's an age where you know it's it's time to make a real 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 move but you know in in life as far as the direction you're going to go but before that those formidable years from 14 around 14 mm -hmm. to, to to 18 mm -hmm. you know what kept kept you together and what kept you like focused what kept you out of out of out of the prison system and two things uh first the grace of god and number two, my grandmother. Right. My grandmother. It's this thing that I call the granny factor. <laughs> okay. Where you live with your grandmother, and your grandmother has such an impact on you psychologically. I remember certain things, certain crimes I just wouldn't commit. Because if I get caught by the police and I'm taken to jail, my first question to the police would be, are you going to call my grandmother? <laughs> I'm not worried about them. Right. I'm concerned right. about her. 
Ed, I tell you a story real quick. I remember we got into a gang fight out on the south side. We from the north side, out on the south south side. We were starting trouble, and one of their one of the opposition's gang members got ran over by one of my friend's cars. So we got cuffed up, thrown in, in the back seat. So they were obviously very upset that their friend had just gotten run over. They didn't know whether he was dead or alive. I'm sitting in the back seat of the car, and they're gathered around the car like, we gonna kill him, we gonna kill him. So I told the, the police officer told me I had a choice. He said, yeah, yeah dirty, dirty cop. Mm-hmm. He said, now I could take you downtown and they're gonna have to call your parents to come pick you up. Or I can let you out right here. You can face this angry mob. <laughs> so I said, can I call my uncle? He's like, no. You didn't face that mob, man. Come Instead on. of talking to your grandma, you took the mob, huh? Listen, no. <laughs> Will, they say, I said, can I call my uncle? They're like, no. You we gotta call your guardian. At this time, my mother was, was in the drug rehabilitation center. He's like, no, we gotta call your guardian, your grandmother. God is my witness. I got out that car. <laughs> They got the beat down of your life. No, they didn't. Would you ran or what? Well, I fought and ran. I did a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> I got out. Of, I, I got can, out. I of can that. respect that. I, I can respect that. But I wasn't gonna hear my grandmother's voice. But that that is one of the things that I could say kept me in check. Now, when you say that there were certain crimes that you didn't commit, it makes one wonder what crimes did you commit? What was cool for you to to do? And not have to worry about your grandmother getting too well, riled up. No, nah, it was just a matter of whether or not. If if there was a chance that she was going to find out, I wasn't finna do it. Now, okay. selling dope was never an option for me because I saw what drugs did to my family. Mm-hmm. And even at, at the age of 13, 14, 15, I had that kind of conscience, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I couldn't do that to somebody else's family. But... You know, just things things we did to make money in the community right. that, that, that none of us are proud of. You know, when I think about the whole drug thing, I remember when I was locked up, man, and it was dudes in jail for selling drugs who wasn't even caught with the drugs on them. They didn't have any marked money. All they had was somebody standing up and pointing like the Jackson 5. Right. That was it. That's it. And that's all, that's all the, the prosecution had. To me, you know, it's hard to knock a person hustle if you ain't got a better hustle for them. And, and, and it's important that people, when I say hustle, it doesn't mean you're doing, engaging in something illegal. It's just right. like, what, what are you doing to make your money? Right. But it's hard, to, it's hard to knock that. But I got to, I got to speak on the drug thing. If you still selling drugs... In 2016, Man. especially in the inner city, your ass is a damn fool. <laughs> because let me tell you something, man. It, it's really bad when they don't have to catch you with the stuff. All they got to do is have somebody to point at you. And then what they're going to do is pull your record. The first thing they're going to do is pull your file. Okay, okay, you got a prior for this. Okay, um, okay, okay, this one, hmm. got a prior for that. Or oh, they'll say, oh, he ain't got no prize, but okay, well, let's now, let's pull his financials. Then they're going to pull those financials. And then they're going to say, okay, uh, don't look like he has too much money, but, but he drives a Phantom. He drives a Rolls Royce Phantom, <laughs> and, and he wears a lot of jewelry, and we see him at the big fights, and he's always got money. He's got to live in his big old, he lives out in this big old house, and then what they're going to do is they're going to find the records on the car and the house, and it's gonna, they're going to be like, well, whose name is this stuff is in? So if that, if that property is in your mama's name or your girlfriend's name, or your friend's name, or some chick you just met, whatever, whoever right. name is in, they're going to pull their financials. And their but it's record. like, at what point is this an evasion of privacy? What, what point can you say, you can't do that? You just can't decide, oh, 
I'm gonna pull all his records and his mom's records and his sister's records. What I mean, that, that, well, that, that they have the. I mean, that's if I was the police, I'd do it. I mean, especially it out, if it it's later. the federal. I'm government. pulling everything. I'm, it, if it's the federal yeah. government, there's no such thing as privacy. But what I'm my, my point is this: somebody going to jail. If you got right. that stuff, if right. you got all this material stuff, and you can't show where you legally bought this stuff, they're gonna pull your tax records too. Mom, you you got this house in your name, uh, you got this two hundred thousand dollar house, one hundred thousand dollar house, five hundred thousand dollar house, whatever it is, they're gonna pull your tax record. Look here, mom, you own a fixed income. Mm -hmm. You ain't made but thirteen thousand dollars the last year. How in the hell can you afford to live in a $200,000 house? Mm -hmm. If mama can't show them how she was able to do it, mama going to jail. If it's you going to jail, mama going to jail, and whoever else is connected to that paper, go up to that property is going to jail. It's like you in a no-win situation. So some dudes are still selling drugs, and they think the only reason why they haven't been caught is because they're smarter. Let me tell you something. If... The government of the United States can look into a computer and see what's happening in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You better believe they can see what your exactly. ass is doing exactly. on the block in Fifth Ward. And that's exactly what I was about to say. Modern technology is as such that there's so much surveillance around us that if you sell drugs for any short length of time, they already know it. They already know what you're doing. And if they haven't come to get you yet, it's just because they have bigger fish to fry. They or they're building fish their case, a stronger case, they got bigger or a bigger case to come get you. Right. They have bigger fish to fry, or you are, in essence, a catalyst for their plan. They want you out there. Exactly. Spreading the poison in the community. But as soon as they make a decision, they come and get you. Like, selling dope in 2016 is the most backwards hustle ever. And if you really look at it, Will... Even back in the 80s, when everybody was making all the money. Look at all your major drug deals. They're still going to jail at the end They're of the They're still going to, going to jail. But look at all your, your, your Frank Lucas's, your Freeway Ricky Ross's, your Johnny Binders. Look at them in 2016. Most of them don't have much. I'll just say it like that. They don't have much. So if you walk through a door and somebody set a trap for you and you tripped over it and bust your behind why would you look back through that door in 2016 we can look back at the last 30 years and see what the dope game has done to our community why would you want to go back through that door right. it was a trap then and it was a new trap back in the 80s so maybe right. we had an excuse <laughs> to be able to say well we didn't know right but if you can't look back and see it clearly right now, I Something feel wrong. sorry for your family. <laughs> I feel sorry for your family. Listen, man, ladies and gentlemen, y'all got to know who's in, in, in who's sitting right. Here. I'm, I'm I'm just so honored to have this man sitting here. Derek Muhammad is he was the catalyst for bringing all of the rappers together in Houston to go out to Unity Bank on Tuesday of last week and open up accounts. Now, this is a, what we did, is a, before we did that, we met with the mayor, and, and it's important to say that the mayor had no idea that we were gonna do this. And, and, None whatsoever. And, and we specifically talked about that because we didn't wanna put the mayor in a compromising position because we knew that you would have people out there saying, look at him dividing the city yeah. right, and all right, of this right, stuff. Right, so we right. knew, so we kept the mayor in the dark. He did not know that we were going to leave that leave him and then go open up these accounts at this black bank. Now, since then, a number of artists have basically emulated the movement that that we started, yes, that sir. you started. They they're out there opening up bank accounts, you know, all over the United States. But still, there are others who are trying to figure out how we did it, how how you put everything together. So f for those uh, people out there that may be community leaders or they just may be somebody that want to do the same thing in their mm -hmm. city, if you had them in front of you, and, and some of them are listening to this show, what is the script that you can convey to them to basically emulate what we did? First and foremost, any community leader that wants to bring 
the community together to do anything productive has to first and foremost have the right motive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your heart's got to be right. Right. And it's very, very simple. You, you should just want to see your community in a better condition tomorrow than it is in today, today mm-hmm. period. It's very simple. Right. And so it started with a call from the mayor. He called me on the 4th of July, and he was concerned about the murder rate in Houston, which right now is higher than the murder rate in L.A. and in New York. Yikes. And he was saying that if it keeps going, we're going to set a record for homicides in this city. And he was, we were talking about influential individuals that we could reach out to that could get a message to the streets. Mm-hmm. The preachers can't do it. The teachers can't do it. The parents can't do it. But we know that hip hop artists provide the soundtrack to the lifestyle that these youngsters are either living or want to live. So I said, you know what, let me reach out to Willie D, let me reach out to Paul Wall, some of my personal friends, and see if we can pull a meeting together. Well, that same night in Freedmanstown, the historic Fourth Ward, five people were shot, three killed that same night. And in, in that particular shooting, Paul Wall just happened to be there. And... To his credit, he actually tried to save one of the youngsters who got shot out there. Young dude actually died in his arms. So Paul Wall called me the next morning, and we started talking about it. So I was like, okay. Shouts out to Paul Wall, man. Good brother. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal dude. Very, very necessary. Good brother. Good brother. Good brother. So I discussed with him what we discussed with the mayor, and we started pulling a meeting together and making different phone calls. Now, Will, what I didn't calculate was how deep some of the differences that the rappers themselves had among one another. Many of them had not been in the same room for a very long time. Right. Right. So I had to get educated on that. So then I'm going to each individual artist and talking to them about how you all's collective voice is more powerful than any one of your individual voices. And that's just mathematics. Um, Unified, we are stronger than we are as individuals. And it began to come together. But as the meeting was coming together and and I was thinking about the things that we could talk to the mayor about and what could come out of it. And you and I, we've been having conversations maybe for the past three, four months about the difference between conversation and demonstration. It's one thing to talk, but what are we going to do? And every rap artist that I talked to had the same concern. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So I believe I was working out and I had this idea. Man, I I think I know what we can do creatively to use the power of y'all's voices together. I say, man, I'm going to see if I'm going to have, I'm going to see if I'm going to let, if the artist can come all over to Unity Bank and open up a bank account. Same day, I picked up the phone and I ran it by you. You got excited about it. Right, right. <laughs> you don't get excited. You don't get excited about too much. And these were your words you said. I want to be a part of something like that. When you said those words, I knew we had something. Now, the other rappers did not know what we were going to do. They showed up to meet with the mayor. Mm-hmm. And before the meeting... You know, Will and I knew about it before the meeting. We prayed. We were at a round table, and I put it on the table, and they were like, yeah, let's do it. Mm-hmm. So not only did we sit down and meet with the mayor about some very substantive issues, and we came up with some solutions that we're working on right now as it relates to black-on-black violence, well, inner-city violence, let me say it like that, and police community relations, but we all got together and collectively went over to Unity Bank and everybody opened up that account in that black-owned bank. It fired a shot around the country that woke a lot of people up. And yesterday I was downtown at trade day, and a man came up to me, and he looked me in my eyes. He didn't have tears in his eyes, but you know how a man's eyes is watery? Right, right, right. 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 glossy. Right. I don't, I don't like to exaggerate, so he wasn't crying. Right. But they were white. I wanted to say thank you, brother for bringing them artists together 
and y'all going over to Unity Bank. He said, when I saw that, he said, that made me feel guilty. He said, I went the next day and I closed out all my accounts in these white-owned banks and I took all my money to Unity Bank. He said, I did that the next day. He said, I just wanted to come and tell you thank you. And I said to myself, that's what it's all about. Ladies and gentlemen, Brother Derek Muhammad is in the building and we're going to continue this conversation about responsibility and community police relations when we come back. It's Willie D. Live. <laughs> 